Hello and welcome to this TCPA webinar, 20 Minute Neighbourhoods, Creating Connected Places. My name is Julia Thrift and I'm the Director of Healthier Placemaking at the TCPA and I'm going to be chairing today's event. Today's webinar is one of a series of webinars that the TCPA has organised on the topic of 20 Minute Neighbourhoods, sometimes known as Complete, Compact and Connected Places or 15 Minute Cities. There's lots of different terms for them. Today's webinar is only possible because of the support of Sport England and Applied Information. And we're really grateful to both organisations. Without this support, we wouldn't be able to hold this free webinar. We'll be tweeting today from TCPA Health, and we'd love you to tweet too using the hashtag TCPA webinars. And if at any point in the webinar, you've got questions for the speakers, do put them in the question and answer box. Uh, we will be looking at that box when we come to um, putting questions to the speakers. If you put your question in the chat box, it will probably get missed. So please uh, put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Next slide, please. Today, we'll be focusing on the challenges of creating connected places places where it's easy and direct to get from A to B on foot or on bike. And it's so easy that walking, cycling or wheeling are the obvious choice. The challenges of creating connected places vary. Arguably, it isn't too difficult if you're master planning a new place. But what about a historic town? Historic towns were originally designed for walking because until uh, about 1920, most journeys would have been uh, journeys that were walked. So historic towns were traditionally pretty good for walking, but often that traditional road layout was disrupted in the late 20th century to make driving easier. Uh, ring roads were put through historic towns, new dual carriageways and so on, which disrupted the traditional walking patterns. So how do you undo some of that to reprioritize walking and cycling? And perhaps the most difficult places are those that were designed in the second half of the 20th century, a time when it was assumed that everyone would drive everywhere. How do you transform those road layouts, often with lots of cul-de-sacs and main roads, into connected places? And finally, even if the roads and paths are good for walking, how do you give people the confidence to change ingrained behaviours, such as driving the kids to school? How do you give people confidence that if they set off on foot, they'll get to their destination without getting lost if they're in a new place or get stuck in a dead end or arrive late? It's not just the physical infrastructure that needs to change. It's people's habits and giving them the confidence too. And these are some of the topics that we'll be exploring today. So you can see before you today's agenda, we've got some fantastic speakers. Um, uh, so we've got Glyn Tully, um, Associate Director of Head of Urban Design at Levitt Bernstein, who's going to be talking about reconnecting a post-war housing estate. And then Nicola Parker from Cumbria County Council, talking about um, making a historic town better for walking and cycling. We've then got questions with both of those speakers, so do put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. There'll then be a quick break, and then we're going to move on to the topic of giving people confidence to walk. So I'm delighted that we'll be having Richard Simon from uh, Applied talking about wayfinding. And Dr. Katie Karampour, um, a research associate at Cambridge Centre for Housing Research, um, talking about working with communities to increase physical activity. Uh, another question and A session. And then I'm absolutely delighted to have Lawrence Fallon from Active Travel England, a brand new government agency. I'm sure we're all keen to find out what they're going to be doing. Um, so that's today's agenda. Um, we will now uh, start moving on. So next slide, please. For those of you who don't know the Town and Country Planning Association, the TCPA, uh, it's a charity. Uh, we're quite small, uh, very ambitious. And our vision is for a world in which there are homes, places, and communities in which everyone can thrive. And our work includes research, seeking to influence policy, providing training and guidance, and sharing good practice, which is what we're doing this morning. Next slide, please. 
The TCPA has been working on um, 20 minute neighborhoods for some time now. Uh, we first held a webinar two years ago and we heard from people in places such as Melbourne, Australia, about what they've learned from many years of work introducing 20 minute neighborhoods in their um, areas. In 2021, the TCPA published a guide to creating 20 minute neighborhoods in England, and we continue to provide support and advice to councils and communities about how to introduce 20 minute neighborhoods. All of our past webinars and our practical guide to creating 20 minute neighborhoods are on the TCPA's website and you can download them here. And today's webinar will be put on the website too. So now on with um, presentations. Our first speaker is Glyn Tully um, from Levitt Bernstein. Glyn has over 30 years experience working with both private and public sector clients in the delivery of urban design and landscape schemes in the UK and abroad. He's an associate director at Levitt Bernstein and wears two hats as an urban designer and a landscape architect. And he often leads teams working on urban renewal initiatives specializing in creative, creating active and lively townscapes. Welcome, Glyn, and over to you. Thank you, Julia, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to give a over, quick overview of a uh, scheme we're working on in Norfolk, the Abbey Estate uh, in, in Thetford. Um, it's a scheme we've been working on for the last four years. We won it in competition in 2018. And the the, the narrative uh, for, for the estate regen was very much about uh, links, connections, and integration with, with, within the wider context. Um, first slide, please. So just to give you a quick, quick overview of the location of, of Thetford, obviously, Middle, middle of Breckland uh, sits equidistant between Cambridge and Norwich, part of the emerging sort of tech corridor with that sort of future link over to Amsterdam. Um, obviously, Cambridge and Norwich are relatively unaffordable places uh, or quite sort of uh, expensive places to live. So Thetford is sort of, uh, you know, located equidistant on the A11, great location and um, various sort of um, industries are being promoted with, within that corridor um, by through sort of bioscience, agriculture, genetics, so promote promoting those initiatives. So it is a sort of key location uh, within that context. So the estate, next slide please. The estate, the Abbey Estate sits on the west side of Thetford Town Centre. Uh, you can see the sort of area, the site uh, indicated within the sort of circular rings adjacent to the A11. To the north of the town, you have a new sort of sustainable urban extension on a greenfield site, which I would suggest is less sustainable than our site. Our site is 10 minutes walk to the town, um, but like many many of these sort of you know, car dominated towns, dr driving is the sort of primary sort of uh, mode of transport. So what we're trying to do here is try and prom promote cy good cycling links, walking links, use of the rail. So we have the rail to the north, the river to the south, the A11 and Thetford Forest to the west. Next slide, please. So this, the, the, the vision for the place for this sort of 60s estate was very much about trying to break down the sort of historic Radburn layout that the scheme had originally been des designed around. That was very much about sort of promoting car usage and sort of, you know, pedestrian and work links were secondary. Links to the, to the town were um, difficult to find, difficult to discover. So the, the big narrative was about sort of looking at the place and the context and bringing a landscape driven narrative into the estates we very much led with a sort of um, landscape landscape ethos in terms of developing the 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 regeneration of the estate so we have a num number of different character areas the character of the forest to the west so links to the forest and thetford forest which is the largest sort of lowland pine forest in the country 
the river to the south, the Little River Ooze, sort of promoting links to that is relatively unused, that, that river walk. So making more use of that and improving those wider links and connections. Thinking about links to the town, promoting that link past uh, historic abbey ruins, which um, again is a sort of key sort of step on the journey from the site, from the estate to the town. Next slide, please. So the social value overview is, is was a big driver for the, the development of, of the scheme. So thinking about existing uh, job offer um, and um, what people were sort of employed in on, on the estate. So trying to promote sort of jobs and economic growth, trying to promote um, so, you know, meanwhile uses where we could test and explore um, sort of startup businesses and uses as, as part of that narrative. Promoting health and well-being, promoting access to nature, promoting use of um, um, the, the landscape spaces, promoting active lifestyles, promoting play, promoting sport, promoting leisure. I think all, all of these things are sort of key to the overall vision uh, of the place and then the strength of the community which, which which is key to all of our work so underpinning the existing residents understanding their needs and wants talking to them at length and um, what, what are their sort of existing social networks that exist and how how can they be sort of utilized to promote the sort of uh, the, the regen nar narrative going forwards um, there was a you know, very strong existing community that uh, was established late 60s, early 70s. People, residents from the East End were sort of moved out to, to Norfolk. So that was when the existing estate was built. <clears throat> so the historic side, side of the estate is really key uh, to the identity of the place. The other issue that existed was that the issue of the us and them. So the estate was seen as being separate to the rest of Thetford Town. And I think you know part of our work is really about improving those links and connections and try to break down that estate mentality. Next slide, please. So, so far, we've done lots of resident engagement, lots of consultation, lots of talking to, to people, to the local schools, testing ideas, talking about master plan options, looking at various development proposals, looking at levels of um, uh, renewal, new build, and um, this has been sort of key to our process go, going forwards. Underpinning all of this has been the landscape story, which I'll go into in a bit more detail on the next few slides. Next slide, please. So the Abbey estate you can see from this diagram, very much based on the sort of traditional Radburn layout of, um, you know, very much around car, you know, cars, uh, sort of clear, clear sort of circulation, but lots of cul-de-sacs, lots of green space, but not doing anything, not utilised for anything um, uh, meaningful, very little play opportunities, very little opportunities for leisure and recreation, um, lots of issues associated with parking, like all of these estates, and no real sort of clear hierarchy of, of space. Next slide, please. So the, the estate today is very much uh, characterized by roads rather than streets. So you can see top left, lots of gable ends facing, facing onto the road. So what we're trying to do is sort of repurpose these, these roads as streets. So you get more eyes on the places. So they become more enjoyable, more used, more loved. You can see all these images. There's not one person in any of these pictures. Top right, very much about cars fronting, fronting the roads. So, you know, la lack of clarity over public and private space. Bottom right, these green spaces that exist all over the estate. But when you talk to residents, they're, they're much loved. But from our experience, they use, you know, a lot of them use for sort of overspill parking or dumping grounds um, or areas for sort of antisocial behavior. Next slide, please. 
there's just some key stats here from, from the estate about it being in the top 10 most deprived neighbourhoods nationally. Uh, crime within Thetford Town, about 50% of it is, is occurs uh, within the area. Uh, skills level below national averages and life expectancy is relatively low. Um, so interestingly, in the residents recognition, there's a lack of wildlife and planting on the on the estate, but it's surrounded by this amazing sort of uh, countryside um, facility that, that exists. Next slide, please. So I think our our um, <clears throat> intent was to try and mitigate the impact of the vehicle on the street. So looking at the car parking courts, removal of the car parking courts for inclusion of, of new build, um, and looking at repurposing some of these places and spaces for primarily for play, for opportunities for people to sort of meet and gather and, and talk to each other. And just giving a level of clarity uh, within the streets and spaces. Uh, and so it's next slide, please. So the issue, issue of legibility. So here you, you can see example where sort of some of the, the parking garages have been removed and the green spaces have been linked up through the inclusion of sort of uh, a sort of muse house typology to promote uh, a clear clear route and connection for walking primarily so walking and cycling car parking was kept primarily to existing streets with car parking courts rationalized um, to try and sort of tidy up the issue of, of the car parking layouts that existed upon the estate so this is very much about giving clarity over fronts and backs and promoting clear routes and connections around the estate, through the estate, and as well as to the town centre. Next slide, please. So the, the vision at the moment, um, the, the little river ooze to the left is relatively unused. So part of the, the bigger narrative was making this space more usable better connected into the estate, putting up, so the new development on, on the right overlooks existing green spaces, which, which aren't overlooked at the moment. So introducing um, safety, security, and well-loved and used spaces that uh, the new and existing residents could utilize. Next slide, please. Big concept. So again, going back to this sort of place-driven narrative, thinking about connection to the links of, to the forest, um, to the wider cycle networks to the north, to the river, to the town, and to the priory. Halfway through the project, we found a sort of uh, high-pressure aviation fuel pipeline running through the middle of the site. So this this rail so this rail to river corridor was it was introduced as a sort of linear park that helped uh, deliver a great opportunity for, for the residents and as part of the sort of wider estate master plan. Next slide please. So providing clear routes and connections was, was key. You can see the yellow route, um, the, the Muse route that I described earlier uh, has been introduced to connect this, these series of spaces running outside of Canterbury Way, which is the main sort of vehicular route through the middle of the state. What that does is help link up those spaces. It provides more sort of uh, legibility and clarity and connect connectivity uh, into the scheme so and it was very much about sort of giving a purpose and function for those green spaces to be used um, by the various age groups that were going to be living here next slide please um, the scheme was was identified the retention of uh, around 500 homes. The existing state was around 900. So a limited amount of demolition, but the inclusion of some new build that just helped connect the existing estate back together again. So introducing height where required, providing a focus around the central green, uh, the central green um, space within the heart of the master plan 
where non-residential uses uh, are, are proposed to be included. Um, so community uses, small scale retail. I think it's important to say that the more, you know, the more density you can get into a scheme, the, the, the greater the density, the greater level of non-residential uses you, you can get in, which promote the sort of cycling and walking uh, narrative. Um, next slide, please. So here you can see um, some of the sort of visuals that we prepared to help um, describe uh, the topics that we were trying to deal with. So improving the riverside aspect to the south, looking at a, lin a new linear path from road to rail through the middle of the master plan, a new neighbourhood no, heart for the community, including non-residential uses, improved connections to the town via this historic route, Potter's Path, that will be going through past the uh, historic Abbey ruins. And then most importantly, the new park in the middle of the scheme, including sort of sports, leisure, recreation, and opportunity for sort of suds and dealing with sort of uh, surface water drainage issues. Next slide, please. This is just a series of visuals that I wanted to run through, just to give you an overview of you know, the importance of, of the landscape upon the narrative. So this is a view of the sort of community heart looking along Potter's path towards the town centre. So you can see the issues associated with you know, the quality of the landscape and the sort of um, opportunities for play, leisure, outdoor markets. And I think this, this is, supported by the level of intervention the level of development that's being supported by the scheme i would say that you know the more development you can achieve the the better the, the quality that can be put into the sort of public realm and, and the landscape next slide please uh, so this is just an image of the existing land uses uh, on the estate you can see all the sort of uh, streets are named after cathedral towns Limit, limit, relatively limited uh, non-residential uses in, in the middle of the plan. So um, we have some sort of small scale of retail, small community building, uh, elderly care, and then a primary school. But you can see the location of those non-residential uses are relatively hidden away from public view. So putting them part and parcel in, in the middle of, of, of the vision was key. Next slide, please. So you can see here, we've opened up that community heart to make those uh, non-residential uses more, um, more visible to, to residents, part of the sort of bigger park narrative, which will help sort of animate that, that key space uh, as, as part of the, the, the master plan. And it, also next slide, please. So, and analyzing existing movement was key. So you can see here the, uh, the the issue associated with these little sort of rat runs. The um, the blue dotted lines indicate pedestrian links, but they weren't very well overlooked. They were used by sort of you know joy riders, moped riders to sort of you know commit crimes and get away, and they were really deemed to be unsafe. So. Next slide, please. What we tried to do is to sort of, you know, link them up, make them more visible, get more eyes on the street, and just give a sort of, you know, use and, and purpose to, to those spaces. Um, and again, just thinking about the sort of the movement hierarchy is key. So very much about, you know, focusing on children's play, pedestrian cycle links. Um, and then trying to sort of control the, the impact of, of the vehicles uh, on, on the street environment. Next slide, please. A big part of the place-making narrative is, is where you introduce height with, within the master plan. So thinking about long range views and connections, if you can see, if you can see where you're going, if you can see a marker building, that is going to encourage you to sort of use that route, use that connector. It also helps 
in terms of your understanding of the place at the moment the estate is relatively um it's a bit of a sort of mon monoculture of sort of height and form what we're trying to do what we're trying to do is introduce height and variety uh, into that narrative so we sort of you know introduce bookends landmarks uh, gateways next slide please It's important to say with, with estate regeneration, you're dealing with people's lives. So, you know, what is what is it in it for existing residents? So we were looking at potential meanwhile uses associated with the river. So this was part of a sort of you know leveling up fund uh, application to, to the to the government to um, look look at initiatives to again promote use of, of the riverside area through in, improved lighting, improved gateways, looking at um, sort of uh, growing opportunities, work, working with local so, you know, um, interested parties within the estate who are keen to promote some, some of these ideas. On, on the right hand side, you can see the existing gateway to the town. I think you can see the issue that exists with sort of, you know, blockages and gateways that aren't well signposted, aren't well lit um, and aren't clear and navigable by, by people. Next slide, please. So again, just going back to the sort of development of, of the character areas, which, which I think is really important in terms of developing the, the place narrative. So you can see here from this visual, what we're trying, you know, this is the main uh, Canterbury Way road. We're now repurposed it as a street, put it on a diet, controlled the parking, made pavements wider, introduced or retained as many trees as, as we could whilst promoting sort of um you know green and sort of verdant uh land landscape conditions next slide please and again just just a sort of reiteration of, of this you know involvement of, of the different character areas to give the character and identity to the place next slide please so the so it's just a series of images here to give you a sort of flavor so the lane the mew street we were talking about uh, you can see where you've got sort of you know front doors uh front fronting onto a you know quite a sort of contained comfortable street focused on children pedestrian cyclists um which you know at the, at the moment doesn't exist at the moment but but i think it you know it's, uh gives a really nice character and we're hoping this this is sort of loved and used by by the new existing residents and you can see an image here bottom right what what's existing at the moment in terms of the, the garage courts next slide please potter's path as i mentioned the link to the town the link to the town center so you know again lining that with uh residential with good quality planting play opportunities seating opportunities um I think you know as much overlooking of, of these places as, as possible, and introducing visual interest, landscape interest, uh, good quality lighting is, is key. Next slide, please. Lynn, just a couple of minutes. Yep. Thanks. Um, yeah, just a, another visual of, of the sort of neighbourhood heart. So the overlooking of the park, um, probably. You know, it's it's going to be a big space at the moment. You can see bottom right, the, the space is occupied by a four storey block of flats. So again, we've sort of removed those, repurpose, reposition those those uh, residents to the north of Canterbury Way and provided this fantastic uh, gr green lung uh, within the fulcrum of the master plan. Next slide, please. The riverside which you know I've, I've showed this before but, but again think about uses for the river could we use it as you know park and glide could we use it for leisure and recreation canoeing um um paddle boarding have all been sort of muted as, as ideas for animating that space and in using it as a connector to the town next slide please and then canterbury way which uh i'll you'll have seen this before but again i think controlling parking controlling bus movements um inclusion of sort of bus bus stops on on these spaces is is important next slide please 
and that's the end of my presentation thank you hopefully ben, that's on time so much that, that that's brilliant um uh, the abbey estate looks so familiar i think and will look familiar to many people because there are so many similar places around the country that are looking neglected and um could be so much better so it's fascinating to see what you're doing there I'm sure there must be many, many questions. There are a few questions coming in. Uh, do put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll pick them up after our next presentation. So I'm really pleased to welcome Nicola Parker. Um, Nicola is a transport planner and project manager with a background in infrastructure planning, sustainable transport, scheme development and business case preparation. Nicola's worked at Cumbria Council, County Council for more than 10 years, and in October last year took on a new role as Senior Programme Manager for the County Council's Cycling and Walking Programme. And the role was put in place to recognise the importance that Government and the County Council are placing on active travel. So Nicola, thank you very much for joining us this morning, and I shall hand over to you. Um, good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for inviting me um, here today. So I am um, Nicola Parker, the Senior Programme Manager for the County Council's Cycling and, and Walking Programme. So in this webinar session, I'm going to provide you with a very brief introduction to the national and the local context for active travel and outline the cycling and walking programme we have established for the County Council to deliver against this agenda. We will then look at the plans for improving active travel connectivity in Kendal. So there is really strong national um, strategy and guidance framework for cycling and walking, the cycling and walking investment strategies one and two, um, guidance on how to develop cycling and walking plans for a local area through the LC WIC guidance, um, new cycle design guidance and the 2021 gear change document. And also we now have a gear change one year on. So in addition to all of this um, national strategy and guidance and the Department for Transport's decarbonising transport plan was published in summer last year. And this again highlighted the importance of accelerating modal shifts to public and active transport and for these to be the natural first choice for our daily activities. Cumbria County Council has a long term commitment to improving cycling and walking within the county. And this is reflected in many of our um, strategy documents. Um, in recognition of the decarbonisation, economic and wellbeing benefits that can be achieved from increasing active travel. In, in addition, in the county, we have the zero carbon um, Cumbria partnership and this is looking specifically at transport as one of its work streams and how changes to this can contribute to net zero in the county. Um, in February this year the County Council approved a new local transport plan for Cumbria. This is known as the Cumbria Transport Infrastructure Plan and this covers a 15 year period between 2022 and 2037. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few slides time. Um, we've also seen the establishment of Active Travel England, an executive agency of government that have been established and can provide support to local authorities in delivering against the active travel agenda. And I think later on today, um, there's a speaker from Active Travel England, so that's um, excellent. Um, so the, the um, sorry, I'm not as, aha, we have the slides are moving on. I'm not asking them to be moved on, but they're getting moved on nicely. So thank you, Gemma. Um, the national vision for cycling and walking is set out in gear change is to transform the role that cycling and walking plays in our transport system and get England moving differently so that England will be a great um, walking and cycling nation with more people making more journeys by cycling and walking. Um, supported um, by a, a first class cycling and walking infrastructure um, network. Um, so this is emphasized again in the DFT decarbonizing transport plan. Um, so just moving on to the next slide. So in 2021, we saw the introduction of new design standards for cycling infrastructure. This includes some core design principles around coherent, direct, 
stay comfortable and um, attractive um, networks. And also summary principles that we need to develop our cycling improvements in line with. These new standards set out clearly the type and quality of infrastructure we should provide be provided. However, this can be extremely challenging to deliver for a number of reasons, including physical space, reallocation of road space, and public and political support to do so. This can be particularly challenging in, in rural and historic towns um, such as Kendall. Um, moving on to the next slide, so Cumbria County Council and Cumbria Local Enterprise Partnership approved our new local transport plan in February this year. This sets out our strategic approach for active travel in the county for a 15 year period and has um, and the vision and approach for cycling and walking in Cumbria is embedded within this. So the County Council has an ambitious programme for cycling and walking. Um, the programme includes developing plans for where cycling and walking improvements are needed, delivering that infrastructure, and we've also started to look at activity around behavioural change. So the main focus today has been on the plan making, and key to this plan making component of the programme is the development of the six local cycling walking infrastructure plans to help facilitate modal shift for shorter journeys in each of Cumbria's key towns and one of these being Kendall. We also have active travel um, strategies for strategic corridors that will connect the towns in Cumbria and provide um, opportunity for longer distance commuting um, as well as improving um, the offer that Cumbria has for recreational cycling to the benefit of residents and visitors alike. So um, LC WHIPs, so these were developed by the Department for Transport as part of the National Cycling and Walking Investment Plan. Um, the LC WIP approach enables to understand how people travel and provide the infrastructure needed to encourage walking, cycling and wheeling trips. LC WIPs are developed through a six stage process and key to this is the gathering of a strong evidence base to assist in the securing of funding for cycling and walking by providing a long-term plan for cycling and walking investment at a local level. Um, the Department for Transport and Now Active Travel England have been clear in setting out that funding for local cycling and walking infrastructure schemes will um, be heavily dependent upon um, schemes being included in an LC WIP and, and locations being able to demonstrate that they have an overall plan um, for, for infrastructure and if investment is given for a piece of infrastructure this is part of something that will start to contribute to a network in a, in a location and then that will have the most impact on actually getting people to change how they travel and getting that modal shift. Um, so let's have a look at um, Kendall um, LC WIC. So in Cumbria, we have um, six LC WIPs covering our five main towns and city of Carlisle. These have been developed in line with the government six stage process, but we also built into that extra engagement and consultation in the development. Um, the County Council Cycling and Walking Team with support from consultants WSP have developed an LC WIP for Kendall. This has now been approved by the County Council and endorsed by um, the District Council, South Lakeland District Council and the Ke Kendall Town Council who worked with us on the development of the plan. Um, our Cumbria LC WIPs have also recently won an award for Sustainable Transport Project of the Year from the CIHT Northeast and Cumbria Division. So we, we were really pleased with that, reflecting the hard work that went into um, developing these comprehensive plans. Um, so moving on to the next slide, public and partner engagement has played a big role in the development of the plans, um, including project delivery groups, stakeholder workshops, and two separate rounds of consultation for each LC WIP. And also, um, we, we did manage some um, live events despite COVID, and this feedback was all very helpful in shaping um, the LC WIPs that we, that we have today. So um, through the public consultation, we've received feedback on the barriers to cycling and walking in Kendall. 
And, and if, if we can put in place infrastructure that encourages people to walk, cycle and wheel, we know there is good potential to get more people cycling and walking in Kendal. There are notable percentages of work journeys that are in reasonable cycling and walking distance. So 40% of journeys to work are less than five kilometres and 27% are less than two kilometres. So up to five kilometres is considered to be a reasonable cycling distance and up to two kilometres is considered to be a reasonable distance for walking. There's a really strong potential in Kendall to get that modal shift if we can get um, the infrastructure in place that gives people the confidence to use those active travel modes for their everyday journeys. So why is it um, local cycling and walking infrastructure planning important for Kendall. So connectivity is key to creating attractive places to live and work. Um, the district of South Lakeland employs approximately 43,000 people, which accounts for 21% of all employment in Cumbria. A significant proportion of this employment is concentrated within the LC WIP area, primarily within Kendall itself. Um, the town of Kendall is relatively compact, um, with a number of retail, education, leisure sites banned in the river corridor. Many people live and work with a distance that can be undertaken on foot or by bike. An investment in the streets where people live or work could create more attractive and desirable places, particularly where the investment promotes sustainable modes of travel. Um, Active travel can help respond to the climate crisis. So Cumbria has set itself an ambitious challenge to be one of the first carbon neutral counties in the UK by 2037. That's through the Cumbria Zero Carbon Partnership. Um, Decarbonising transport is key to achieving this goal. Cycling and walking is a much lower carbon footprint compared to other forms of transport. And undertaking more journeys on foot or by bike will help to tackle climate change. Um, active travel is also um, great for supporting health, well-being, and access for all. So active travel can play a crucial role in supporting public health and well-being. It is one of the most simple and most effective ways of enabling adults and children to meet the recommended levels of physical activity. It can also help improve accessibility and social inclusion. So um, a statistic here for you, 18% of households in Kendall are without access to a car. Um, also important for improving the tourism offer. So Cumbria is well known for the fantastic leisure cycling and walking opportunities that the landscape offers. And Kendall is a key gateway for visitors to the area and to the wider Lake District World Heritage Site. The Kendall LC WIP integrates with existing longer distance leisure routes such as the Walney to Weir, National Cycle Network Route 70 and National Cycle Network Route 6. So on the next slide, I have included the walking and priority cycling networks plan for Kendall to give you a feel for the extent of the infrastructure identified in the plan. The LC WIP identifies the types of improvements that could be implemented for cycling and walking on each of the priority and core routes, but these will need further um, development to work out the detail of what we could actually deliver on the ground. So all of the plans can be found on the County Council's walking and cycling webpage if you're interested and want to be able to zoom in a little more. So the plans include 31 claims kilometres of cycling improvements and 21 kilometres of walking improvements for Kendall. Um, we recognise that it's not possible to connect everywhere, so the LC WIP focuses on the most important routes to start with and to secure funding for. We know support for walking and cycling infrastructure usually increases further once it is built and people are using it, and over time these priorities can be built on to deliver a more extensive network to encourage and support a set change in the number of people cycling and walking. So the cycling network plan identifies where new infrastructure is required and also where existing infrastructure needs to be improved to bring it up to the latest design standards set out in the local transport note 120. Um, 
The network makes use of Kendall's natural assets with a focus on active travel routes running along the river and canal corridors. It incorporates new cycling routes and improvements to existing alongside existing provision to provide a coherent, direct, safe, comfortable and attractive network for Kendall. Um, the cycling network reflects the importance of connectivity across the LT with area to increase its active travel and reduce car journeys. So the walking network, the walking plan identifies a core walking zone in Kendall Town Centre and core walking routes leading into this. So core walking zones are areas with the highest potential for footfall and these are generally in our town centre and employment areas. The LC WIP identifies potential improvements within the core walking zone and along the walking routes, which could include new or enhanced road crossings, better quality public splits, and paths and provision of dedicated and separated spaces for walkers. Um, moving on to the next slide, the LC WIP is an unfunded plan. Um, the LC process requires us to prioritise improvements. Um, so we've done this prioritising over a 15 year period to match the timescales of the Cumbria Transport Infrastructure Plan. And within that, we've identified small sections of the network that already have funding, things that we aspire to deliver within five years, things we'd like to deliver within eight years, and then eight years plus. The plan is subject to securing funding for delivery over the next um, 15 years, and, and the funding to deliver against the plan is absolutely key. Um, so what's next? Um, we are continuing to develop routes within the LC WIPs and um, a number of routes identified within the LC WIP have already been developed to a concept design level. Um, this, there is further ongoing scheme development looking at other routes in the LC WIP and having developed schemes puts us in the best possible place to bid for funding to deliver against the LC WIPs. However, um, there are opportunities and challenges associated with this, including development of schemes in line with the new standards, retrofitting these into our historic towns where space can often be constrained, land ownership can easily challenge the deliverability of schemes, especially where this is out with the highway boundary, alongside the need to sometimes change the legal status of routes, for example, from a public right of way to a bridle way. The increasing construction costs can make even a small section of improvement designed to the new standards costly to deliver and reduce the benefit ratios. Government have announced significant funding investment in active travel infrastructure, 2 billion back in gear change, but the competitive bid environment to get a share of the funding can fall short of the aspiration to deliver our LC wits. Um, Moving on to the next slide, I thought I should also mention um, the Kendall 20 mile per hour pr proposal. So the proposals in development for 20 mile per hour speed limit in Kendall. So locally, a working group has been established to take this forward. And the proposal um, for the extent of this has been prepared. And this is currently under review following feedback. Traffic data is being collected and further data collection plan to inform how this 20 mile per hour zone could come forward. Um, at this point, no funding has been identified or skewered towards progressing beyond initial data collection to inform the scope of the scheme. Um, the scope is still in development and it is recognised that this could be delivered over a number of, of phases. Um, the County Council are also looking at a 20 mile per hour policy to set out how to consider 20 mile per hour requests going forward. But reducing speeds is beneficial for cycling, walking and wheeling and could create a better environment for active travel in Kendall. So that brings me um, to my final slide and the end of the presentation. If you would like any further information, you can look at the County Council web page on cycling and walking. And if you want to contact the team, we also have a team mailbox. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, you have and I'll hand you back over to um, Julia. Great, thank you, Nicola. That was really, really interesting and a fantastic contrast with our first presentation.
Um, I'll give you a moment to catch your breath. Uh, but Lynn, if you could put your camera on um, and join us, that's wonderful. Um, we have got questions. People in the audience, do put your questions in the Q&A box and we will try and pick up as many as possible. Um, so Lynn, while I give Nicola a moment to catch her breath, perhaps I can put some questions to you. There have been quite a lot of, of questions about parking. So your um, uh, redesign of, of the Abbey Estate removes a lot of car parking, a lot of garages. Um, where are all the cars going to go? Can you can you talk us through how many you know how, how you're dealing with that? Will, will those beautiful images you show actually turn out to be littered with cars? It, it, it's been the, the the biggest topic in terms of uh, the, the the regeneration of the estate. I, I wouldn't say we're we're removing it; we're rationalising it. So, I mean, the 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 parking obviously the parking courts, parking garages aren't used for. Generally, they they aren't used for cars; they're used for storage. Um, and I mean, ev everyone you speak to on the estate says there isn't enough parking already on the estate, and that's you know, it. it if you go there, it's p p parking on the verges, parking on dry, you know, parking everywhere really. Um, so we've done you know work work with the with Acom on the sort of transport side done lots of traffic traffic counts and just got to grips with the numbers that are involved in terms of quantum of, of parking on, on the estate um so obviously you know working working with the authorities on on agreeing levels of parking has, has been key and uh, we've taken an approach where obviously we're, we're dealing with existing residents and parking and then new residents and parking and though those numbers are are different so anyone coming in anyone sort of you know coming into the estate is going to have to sort of you know sign up to a sort of you know slightly lower level of car car ownership you know the parking number is going to be slightly less so it's nuanced on on that side of things but we're, we're trying to promote you know parking on street parking in courtyards and allocating spaces for par parking um it's just you know tidying up what what's that what's there um but 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 yeah i mean it it's prob problematic it it's the, yeah. the the biggest topic that we've been gr grappling yeah. with i think on on this scheme so the new the, the new homes that would will, will be built um will they have bike storage instead i think yeah i mean i with, with all of our work it's all about bikes and bins and incorporating that in in into that the strategy so understanding where the refuse vehicle goes there's nothing worse than having a state littered with with bins so incorporating that in, into the front garden so what we generally do is is you know on, on houses we'll probably be looking at you know bit bins and bike storage incorporated within front gardens in apartment in apartments we do communal cycle cycle stores cycle storage uh within sort of communal courtyards and especially you know especially uh, around the sort of community hub area um there's i don't think there's any existing cycle parking on, on the estate at the moment you know and you very rarely see you know apart from the few children there's very few people cycling yeah yeah okay yeah and and nicola turning to you now um can you you just tell me what's been the most difficult problem you've faced? I think um, I, I think it's around making sure that we have the public support for what we're trying to achieve. So making the plans is <laughs> making the plans is relatively easy because it's a plan and and you know we have taken account of a lot of feedback in developing those plans and that's reflected in our plans the biggest challenge is when we come to actually start to look at designing up that infrastructure so the lc whip identifies a route and the types of infrastructure we could, we could put on it but then we have to actually look at the space we have and we have to um of try and accommodate the the needs of all um users so you know we've got our cyclists with walkers but we have got um bus routes we have we need to have emergency service access we need to have access 
for, for residents to their residential areas. We need to make sure that we do have um, that connectivity for the highway for businesses. So it's just balancing all those needs and actually getting schemes that we can take through to delivery on the ground that are supported by all those different user groups and um, within constrained spaces in our historic towns. And I think um, Active Travel England, and it might be a question that I might ask Active Travel England later, I think they're working on some guidance around sort of rural areas and towns because LTN is obviously easiest to apply in big cities where there's lots of space, but we need to reach these standards of coherent, direct, safe, comfortable and attractive infrastructure or people won't use it. But the practicality of actually um, delivering that on the ground. And then, you know, when we do deliver schemes on the ground, um, we can have um, a backlash from the, the vehicle drivers and the motor vehicle traffic. So it, it's really very difficult to keep all users happy and make sure we have public support for our schemes. That doesn't mean that we won't carry on doing it, but they're, they're definitely some of the, the challenges we face. So um, Active Travel England can offer um, support to local authorities to help negotiate through these things. So we're really looking forward to working more closely with Active Travel England as they get established and, and the resources built up to, to help us with we're learning on this all the time. It's relatively new and we're not experts in it. Um, so to get that sort of guidance and best practice from around the country through Active Travel England, that'll really help. I think I've got a delivery, so I'm just going to go and get that. So okay. please tailor the next question to Glyn and I'll be back in a second. OK, thanks, Nicola. Um, Glyn, can you, can you tell us what stage the Abbey Estate work is at? Um, Quite lots of questions about from people who, who weren't quite clear. You know, is it on site? Is it still plans? Where are you up to? Uh, well, we've been four, four years in the process and we're on the verge of submitting an outline planning application. Um, I think in January, planning application goes in with, with a view to getting a sort of detail on the first phase, uh, probably uh, early, early spring. Um, so and, and I think with these state region schemes, they always take a long time because of the engagement consultation process to, to do it, to get everyone's buy in. You need to do it. You need to take your time in terms of doing that engagement side of things. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, you know, a big, big part of, of what we're doing is about trying to change people's behavior about movement, connections, promoting walking and cycling. So that's been a sort of slow journey, I think. And we're going to be talking more about that after our break yep. in a minute. Um, we've got another question for you, which is, can a neighbourhood so close to the town centre be a 20 minute neighbourhood in itself? Um, so, uh, thoughts? Um, I mean, set, set, set for town centre, yeah, it's 10, 10, 15 minutes walk uh, for, 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 from the estate. Um, and obviously it's got its own attractions. It's got, you know, it's got the Dad's Army Museum. It's got the statue of Captain Mannering in the town. But actually providing a service and a need for the local community is, is important. I think, you know, the, com the community centre issue the sort of health service that their, their health issue is something that we're um prom promoting at the at the moment trying to get health usage in there i think somewhere where you can buy a pint of milk and you know the the newspaper you know the local no neighborhood shop uh is, is going to be key i think opportunities for sort of employment meeting gathering space it, it you know it's more more about the sort of experience of the place so it's not just a housing estate it's more of a you know a sort of mixed use neighborhood so i think you know giving opportunities for that experience that enjoyment of the place is is you know is part of part of the the the, the bigger story yeah thank you so it may not have everything that everybody wants every day there but you mm. hope that there'll be a lot of the things that many people want most days there i suppose yeah, 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 and and really? I think it, you know it's driven by density and and quantum yeah. of housing, isn't it? You know the sort of needs and wants are, are driven by the the sort of volumes of population that are, that are coming into the area. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, Nicola, um, something for you about sort of culture change of, you know, people who are used to just driving everywhere, being encouraged to walk and cycle. In addition to the physical infrastructure that you're going to be creating, are you going to be doing any initiatives to help people use that physical infrastructure? Yes, absolutely. So behavioural change is just something we've started to think about in the programme. So we've established at the county council a behavioural change officer group. So we've got people with an interest in that from across the county council collaborating and thinking about how we can start to um, make some, some traction on this area. It's difficult as well because our LC whips are at a really early stage. So we haven't got... Um, uh, coherent, direct, safe, comfortable and attractive cycling network in our towns that's readily be available to promote. So we've got to be really careful about that. Obviously, walking is easier because you can generally walk places without, um, you know, having to put in place this sort of specific, specific infrastructure. Um, so, yeah, we are we are thinking about how we will do that. So we are looking at um, what information we have on our website. We're looking at things like case studies of people that have actually made that shift. So um, we've got some colleagues at the county council that during COVID times did things like, you know, sell the car and now travel to um, buy bike to work every day. And that was just something they never did before. So we want to use case studies to show um, that it can be done. We've also got some funding um, from the Department for Transport. Unfortunately, it's not for Kendall, but it's for Barrow and Carlisle, and it's for active travel social prescribing pilots. So that's about encouraging um, behavioural change to get people travelling actively for the health, and that needs to come with a whole list of, of products that can be prescribed and behavioural change activity to promote those. So we're going to use Barrow and Carlisle in the county as pilot areas. We're one of only 11 authorities in the whole of the country that got that funding. We'll use Barrow and Carlisle as areas where we can really have that behavioural change activity, and then we can use that for pilots as to, roll, to roll that out around the rest of the county in the future. You're just on mute, Julie. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, and a little box flashed up on my screen saying that my computer might restart. So if I disappear, I will come back again. I promise you all. Um, so I'd like to put this final question to both of you, and then we're going to have a break. Uh, and the question is, did your projects involve people from your public health teams or the local public health teams? So, Glyn, public health, any involvement that you're aware of? Sorry, um, none that I'm aware of. No, I don't think it did. It should okay, be. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> you don't know whether the public health team reviewed the plans at any point. That might have happened behind the scenes, but you're not aware of it. I'm I'm not aware of it. Okay, right. And and Nicola, public health involved? <clears throat> yeah, we, we have a programme level group at the County Council where we update colleagues across all the different service areas on the programme and try and make connectivity between our different work streams. So public health do sit on that. And through the Active Travel Social Prescribing Pilot, we've linked heavily in with our public health colleagues in putting in our bid to government, and we'll need to continue doing that. So yes, we have. Um, we probably need to make sure we're linking in with them as well on the design of the infrastructure um, and, and build on what we've started so far. But yeah, we have done a little bit of that to date. And yeah, I can see that they could add value to the process and, and bring um, different perspectives to things we're developing. So um, thanks for that. Um, right. And they're particularly good at thinking about how the people with the worst health might uh, be able to use those spaces. So in terms of reducing health inequalities and, and helping the people who are least active, they can be a really valuable resource. So, um, great. So we now have um, a 10 minute break. I'd like to thank Nicola and Glyn for their fantastic presentations, two very different perspectives, but really relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, so you, you very much focused on the physical infrastructure. We're going to get much more into um, what we've just been talking about, the encouraging behaviour change, supporting behaviour change. So do stay with us. Um, you can leave your um, uh, computer running. We'll all switch our screens now.
cameras off and we will see you at a quarter past. So thank you very much. See you in 10 minutes.
Hello everyone and welcome back to the second part of this webinar about creating connected places. Um, I'm delighted to have with us today um, a number of really interesting speakers who are going to be talking about how we give people the confidence that they can walk and cycle, that they'll get to where they want to get to, that they know where they're going, that um, they can take a rest if they need to, they're not going to get lost. Because it's not just about creating the physical infrastructure, the streets and paths that we need, it's also about encouraging people so that we do get behaviour change and people stop driving all the time, even for short journeys, and feel that they can go for a walk or cycle to get to their destination. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Richard Simon. And Richard, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, um, Simon or Simon, I'll accept either. All right. Thank you very much. And I know you've been a bit under the weather, so I really appreciate you being with us today. And if you're a bit croaky, we will forgive you. We're just delighted to have you here. Um, so um, I shall introduce you. Richard has developed a new approach to urban and transport planning and how information appears on streets and in what form. And at Applied Information Group, as he oversees methodology for naming, placement, routes and modal integration, he drives consultations with stakeholders and local communities. And he's been instrumental in applying techniques used in fields of engineering and planning to optimise the placement of signs in the public realm while mitigating against street clutter. And Richard has been very much involved in the Legible London project, which some of you might know. Um, it's the, the um, signposts that tell pedestrians where they are and where to go. And it's now so much part of London that I think we all take it for granted, but it really is hugely, hugely innovative. So Richard, we're delighted to have you here and I will now pass over to you. Um, thank you, Julia, for that introduction. Um, you can tell we've got a comms team now. That was way better than I could have written about myself. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you to TCPA um, team for inviting me. Um, what I want to do today, as best I can, is give a pithy explanation uh, for the need for wayfinding and the benefits it brings to people who use it, the places um, it's implemented, the organisations that are responsible for those places. And by the end, you'll have more questions and answers, no doubt, and hopefully recognise that wayfinding will make a significant contribution to the success of projects like the 20 Minute Neighbourhood. Let's face it, if you're interested in creating complete, compact and connected places to support people living healthier, more active lives, then you're going to need a really good wayfinding system. In our experience, and from what users have told us, wayfinding gives them the confidence to explore farther and for longer to be lost knowing that they'll soon reconnect with places and to make better, more sustainable choices about their mode of transport. So well-designed wayfinding is the key to unlocking great places. Um, next slide, please. Um, these days this is what many people think wayfinding is. It's Google Maps or other products are available. Um, tools have become increasingly sophisticated at both the outdoor and indoor navigation, and they're fantastic. Um, they help you find your way point to point can provide real-time information about journey choice, give turn-by-turn -turn instructions with haptic feedback that not only helps visually impaired people, but also means you can keep your phone in your pocket whilst walking around the city, very useful from a safety perspective. Their near ubiquity has led many clients to ask why they shouldn't simply rely on these apps for their own wayfinding. And it's a fair question and really one for another day, but in, in lieu of that, what I would say is that they have an important but not exclusive role to play. Um, really effectively relying on these tools, managers and owners are delegating the experience of their places to third parties because the app developers decide what to include and how to include it and which routes to take based on their own commercial algorithms. And also they're not as inclusive as you may think. I mean, there's 15% of us, generally the most disadvantaged and elderly, do not have smartphones. So, so what happens to them? If we want to have great experience of places for people to move about, heads up, taking in the world around them, experiencing in the way that we want them to, then these tools need to be used alongside others. Um, next slide, such as these. Um, Map-based signs, directional information, street nameplates, printed maps. Next slide. Um, an array of um, integrated information that connects people across modes, media, 
and events and to community facilities next slide parks and open space uh, open spaces <clears throat> all fantastic tools that are critical to helping people understand places and find their way around which of course i would have to say otherwise i'd be out of a job um, these tools though are only still part of the answer to the bigger question of what is actually wayfinding and how should we be thinking about it in order to create better places next slide but we define wayfinding as this a technique that uses sensory cues to help people intuitively understand their environment and how to get around. And we define it as a technique that people use. Signs are simply part of that wayfinding toolkit that we create to help people wayfind. Next slide. Um, another part of the toolkit is placemaking, which we define as a technique that uses environmental and social factors to create and support place identity. And both definitions talk to the legibility of places and has led us to ask as practitioners how we can make places more accessible, more intuitive and livable. Next slide. And, and that toolkit can play out something like this. Um, you've got um, visual, graphic, text based, environmental and placemaking touch points that provide people with the right piece of information at the right time in the form that they want and need it to help them and their understanding of places and journeys. Each piece of information is connected and it's meaningful and has a specific function. Next slide. And as you experience the information, it answers the questions we ask ourselves as we move about places. We say that wayfinding is the answer to a question. Um, where am I? Where is the park, the health centre? Which way can I go or which mode can I use, for example? So this is why wayfinding needs to be fully integrated across all media and all modes. Next slide. Uh, at its core, wayfinding should reduce people's uncertainty and anxiety about places and journeys. Uncertainty creates friction and barriers to movement and barriers to positive experiences. Um, next slide. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, anxiety um, can paralyze positive behavior. Everything becomes an uphill struggle, limiting the limiting people's ability um, for exploration and enrichment. People tend to focus on or revert to safe and familiar behaviours, for example, preferring um, private over public transport, returning to the same places or following the same routing. Next slide. What good wayfinding does is reduce uncertainty, increase predictability, consistency and familiarity of information, which in turn increasing pe increases people's um, confidence. Next slide. Um, it does many other things, too. Um, we've observed five core benefits that are directly or indirectly influenced by wayfinding. Um, better health outcomes, <laughs> a bit ironic for me today. Um, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, increased commercial activity, better neighbourhoods and greater social inclusion. And these are informed in a fundamental way by providing people with greater awareness of places and journey choice. It's a truism that our research tells us every single time on every project that we do that people don't know places as well as they think they do. Wayfinding helps people learn places and as they learn, they're encouraged to walk more, explore more and make deeper and stronger connections to people and places. Next slide. So, for example, in New York City, we interviewed people in the street. We asked them how well they knew the city. And then we asked them specific questions about local transport and landmarks. But those people who said they're familiar or very familiar with the area, 68 percent still couldn't give directions to any bus stop at all. Forty eight percent couldn't locate uh, famous major landmarks in the vicinity and 30 percent couldn't, lo um, couldn't locate um, a local subway station, even though we we're within a couple of blocks. Now, this isn't meant to be a gotcha moment. It's an example of how our brains work. But once we become familiar with a set pattern of behaviour, it gives us an exaggerated sense of confidence about how well we know the places we visit. Wayfinding has to break those bad behaviours, encourage new ones and good ones, which is a difficult task. So next slide. So wayfinding can be bring benefits for sure. Um, we've been measuring and collating them for a long time, and I've learned to put guardrails around how we describe them. And put simply, there's not enough research in this field. The research that has been done is based on the small sample sizes, and it's not easy to control for the impact of those extraneous factors such as 
economic conditions, pandemics, re regeneration, marketing, publicity campaigns, the infrastructure, and so on. Next slide. Um, fortunately, Legible London is one of the most evaluated wayfinding systems, and we have data for that. TfL attributed an increase in walking and having the confidence to walk to Legible London. Walking increased by 5% and confidence to walk increased from 48 to 90%. The number of people who felt lost dropped by a third and journey times reduced by 16%. The Natter appraisal undertaken by Buchanan's indicated a benefit cost ratio of 5 to 1. Now compare this with um, ongoing projects like the West London Tram, which is 1.7 to 1, and Crossrail, which is under 2 to 1 at the time of its green light. Similarly, in Vancouver, um, 8 in 10 people said they were now more likely to walk after the implementation of an on-street wayfinding system in the city, and satisfaction ratings were also very high. Over 80% saying that the systems in Vancouver and Edmonton presented a more positive image of the city. In Waltham Forest, the Mini Holland wayfinding and the environmental improvement schemes led to 40% increase in footfall in the main retail street. A new wayfinding installed in Blue Water Shopping Centre across its car parks and interiors helped it become one of the highest spend per visit of any centre in the UK. Next slide. And then there's connected data and surveys which speak to the potential benefits of wayfinding, but for which there's presently no cause and effect evidence. For example, in New York City, 22% of car trips are under a mile. That's 1.6 million journeys made by car every day. The average walking trip is 1.2 miles, underlining the fact that there's scope for modal shift. Now, the obesity costs um, employers an estimated $45 billion per year and accounts for some 25,000 premature deaths annually in NYC. It's staggering statistics. The city's um, Surgeon General reported that adults should do at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity um, physical activity, such as brisk walking, every day something that only 42% of residents did. And then when you think in Salt Lake, Utah showed people who walked to work decreased their risk of obesity by up to 10%. So what does all this mean? If you recall, walking increased by 5% um, after Legible London was implemented. Would that be effective in New York City? And if so, would it, like um, in Salt Lake, mean that fewer people were at risk of becoming obese? And if so, would that mean fewer people would suffer premature deaths, lead to a reduction in the 45 billion health cost? I haven't seen the research given an answer. Um, but a complementary fact, the GLA's, I think it's 2017, Healthy Streets for London study showed that if every Londoner walked or cycled 20 minutes a day, it would save the NHS £1.7 billion in treatments over the cost of, of, of costs over the next 25 years. Presently, a third of London has managed to do this on any given day. So from a wayfinding perspective, how do we make sure we give ourselves the best chance to deliver these benefits? How do we design systems that give people the confidence to walk, to get lost and found, and to make better journey choices? Next slide. Wayfinding is about changing behaviours. So the first thing we have to do is design for how our brains actually work. For example, our brain creates new memories all the time, yet we don't remember everything we've ever done. Why not? Uh, memories are constantly being made or attempted in the hippocampus. Our brains don't have the capacity or the need to retain every experience and perception and instead only stores important things in our long term memory in the cortex. Critical function of memory is not to do with the past, but with the future. By recalling important experiences, we learn from them. We're better prepared for future events. We use our memory to imagine future possibilities by piecing together different fragments. So how does the brain determine what's important enough to be retained? For memories to be for memories to um, survive and, and be transferred from the hippocampus to the cortex, they need to be consolidated. And this requires one of three things to happen. The first is we make a conscious decision to learn. We pay attention, we make an effort, and we study. The second is that we have meaningful experience. Something significant happens that becomes associated with the memory. This could be noticing something unusual or captivating in the environment. And the link between emotion, memory and place can't be overstated. If you have a strong emotional connection to a place because of a fear or anxiety or excitement or curiosity, there is a stronger chance of that memory lasting. And the third is through repetition, repetition, repetition. The more we practice, the stronger the connections between the synapses in our nerve cells become and the better chance of those memories consolidating. Next slide. Another example of how our brains work is what behavioural economist Daniel Kahneman described as 
fast and slow thinking. System one or fast thinking is what we might call intuition, automatic recall, and involves things we don't want the brain to have to think about every time we do it, such as riding a bike or making our journey to and from work or pressing a button on a lift. Then there's system two um, thinking, which is slow thinking, which requires a lot of energy and takes time and effort, which our brains generally don't like to do. People much prefer things to be intuitive and easy to understand, which is why at moments of stress, for example, when you're short of time or patience, having to work things out, having to choose which button to press, system two thinking can be really frustrating. When we design wayfinding, we need to support fast thinking as much as possible for it to be intuitive. Next slide. And we need to understand how people read places and navigate. Kevin Lynch studied this and codified the physical environment as one of five characteristics, paths, nodes, edges, districts, and landmarks. The way people learn places first is firstly as nodes, where we live, where we work. Then we connect nodes to each other along paths. As we do this, we use edges, barriers, and landmarks to help fix and recall places. As we learn more paths and nodes, we start to fill in those gaps between them and become knowledgeable about um, districts. Next slide. And sometimes when we connect nodes in ways we didn't realise we could, we've, and, and yeah, I think we've all experienced kind of eureka moments when we discover a new connection between places we already knew. This is us filling in the gaps. Factors such as our different cognitive abilities, our opportunities to explore, and the prominence and significance of landmarks and edges mean we learn these at different rates, but the principles are the same. Next slide. Another thing we have to do is design in accordance with a wayfinding hierarchy of need. For wayfinding to be successful, for people to want to use it, for it to be engaging and connect people to place, it has to be built on the fundamental principles of ease of use and predictability. Predictable systems that quickly feel familiar use a common approach to developing the core elements of wayfinding, including naming, content, placement, colours, identity, brand typography, etc. Without this in place, wayfinding won't work properly. It sometimes may feel like a black art that the right information always seems to pop up when it's needed. But in developing this invisible system architecture, it takes a great deal of effort, thinking and planning. Next slide. And one of the strongest ways in which we give people the confidence to walk is by creating intuitive places. Here's an example of an approach we created for a client that was looking to develop intuitive wayfinding from the district scale downwards. We called it placemaking elements, kit of parts, and you're probably familiar with these um, approaches. It had three sections, touch points, which what additive objects are needed to inform or enrich experience. These are signs, landmarking, placemaking, or public art. A quick word about landmarks for wayfinding. It's simplistic to think that placemaking landmarks need to be grand in scale and iconic. Of course, these can and do work in a strategic sense, but we experience places more commonly at a human scale, which requires a more local approach to landmarking. And also it's easy to replicate successful landmarks to generate distinction without considering the consequences. Too much distinction means nothing is distinct and it loses its power for wayfinding. So place, naming, place naming, how should names be used and structured to support consistent understanding of places? This is, um, was an inclusive approach to naming that empowered people by respecting and appreciating what makes them different in terms of gender, ethnicity, culture, um, religion, education, etc. And spatial planning, how should places be arranged and aligned in order to provide an unseen guiding structure for movement and legibility? The intention was to choreograph movements as much as possible to be intuitive without the need for additive signage and information. At the core, the spatial planning is a movement spine, a connector. We described it as the organiser of space and movement. Then the campuses and character areas share common characteristics such as architecture, landscaping and layout, so they can be understood as having their own sense of place. And gateways are used to create a sense of arrival and landmarks. Um, placed here could be used as an identifier. You can tell I worked for a number of years in um, master planning and urban design um, outfit, so we borrowed quite a bit of that language when it comes to understanding how information should be designed. By getting these fundamentals right, we gave ourselves the best chance of creative, intuitive, welcoming places with seamlessly connected information integrated across all modes and media. So what does this mean for the 20 minute neighbourhood? Next slide. Um, the benefits of wayfinding are tangible and can be applied 
um, to the 20 minute neighborhood. Wayfinding encourages urban exploration, connects and promotes local amenities and facilities, and choreographs routing for private and public audiences, which supports the vibrant mixed use sustainable communities. Wayfinding advances the equitable use of public realm and creates legible inclusive environments for everyone, which supports diversity and inclusion. And wayfinding promotes walkable neighbourhoods, raises awareness of transport option, options and encourages a culture of active mobility, which supports well-connected paths, streets and spaces. So hopefully you'll understand a little more about how taking a wider and more in-depth view of wayfinding plays a pivotal role in creating more accessible, intuitive and walkable places and supports people living healthier, more active lives. Thank you. Richard, thank you so much for that. Really, really fascinating stuff. And, and just really interesting to hear the immense amount of thinking that goes behind what can seem uh, perhaps quite as simple to use, but it's only simple to use because of all the thinking that's gone on behind it. So thank you very much for that. And thank you for struggling through, um, you know, not, not feeling terribly well. That was a great presentation. Um, and now um, we're going to move on to our next speaker and we'll take questions after the next speaker. So do put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So our next speaker is Dr. Katie Karampour. Katie is a research associate working on multiple projects at Cambridge Centre for Housing and Policy Research. In addition to an MA in architecture from the University of Tehran, Katie holds an MSc in Urban Regeneration and a PhD in Planning, both from the Bartlett School of Planning, University College London. Her research interests include the role of urban planning and design in reducing inequalities and bringing about a socially and environmentally sustainable future for everyone. So very relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. Welcome, Katie, and I'll now hand over to you. Thank you, Julia. Um, yes, in, uh, hello everyone. In this presentation, I will uh, look at the role of the built environment interventions to increase physical activity with a focus on the role of walking and, walking and uh, cycling route interventions. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, this research that I'll present uh, today was funded by Places for People, one of the largest housing associations in the country, uh, with whom we have had research collaborations for some years now. And uh, the aim of this piece of work was to inform the development of Places for People's interventions to reduce health inequalities, with a focus on the role of built environment interventions that can uh, increase physical activity and does reduce uh, health inequalities as obesity uh, was observed as one of the main issues in the areas that um, places for people operates. And uh, basically they wanted to know uh, more about hard evidence about the effectiveness of uh, some of these uh, built environment interventions and uh, how these interventions being evaluated Next slide, please. Um, the three selected types of built environment interventions for this research were walking and cycling routes, outdoor gyms and playgrounds. Uh, these in interventions have been chosen as they are widely used and are considered to have positive impacts on level of, uh, levels of physical activity. The main methods used for this research were a desk-based literature review of public health publications, including systematic reviews of place-based built environment interventions and their role in improving health, and academic publications evaluating these place-based uh, built environment interventions. Uh, relevant reports and publications uh, produced by NHS and Public Health England were also reviewed to understand the government's approach and direction uh, for future. Next one, please. According to Public Health England, the term health inequalities is understood to mean differences in health status between different population groups that are unfair and avoidable. Health inequalities arise because of the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. 
And uh, these conditions influence people's opportunities for good health and uh, how they think, feel, and act and shape their mental health and physical health and well being. Obesity is one of the main risk factors for diseases that are the main contributors to lower life expectancy in deprived areas. And public health experts and policymakers are increasingly interested in uh, built environment inter interventions as strategies for population wide improvement uh, to reduce obesity and associated diseases. In general, um, the prevalence of obesity in the UK population is one of the highest in Europe, uh, but the rate of obesity is much higher in the most deprived areas in England. Here I put some figures. 28% um, of adults aged 16 plus in England are obese. Uh, statistics shows that the rate is 9% higher in the most deprived areas. And for children aged 10 to 11 in, in year six, basically, 15.5% uh, of children in the least deprived areas are obese compared with 32% in the most deprived areas. In recent years, as I said, a broad range of uh, built environment interventions have been implemented to improve physical health levels. Uh, some of which we saw today, for example, uh, improving public realm or promoting uh, active modes of transportation. Next slide, please. Uh, in our report, uh, we looked at uh, three types of built environment interventions, but as this session, this session is about um, 20 minute neighborhoods, I'll just share some of the evidence in relation to physical activity outcomes related to cycling and walking route interventions. Uh, well, we all know walking and cycling are important source of, uh, sources of everyday activity and uh, are associated with a wide range of health benefits. Um, and a growing number of built environment interventions aim to promote active modes of transport and reduce passive modes of transport. Uh, by implementing walking and bicycle, uh, bicycling uh, trails. There are multiple systematic reviews and scientific articles that evaluate the effects of uh, built environment interventions and uh, basically bringing about some hard information, hard data of uh, the impact. The, the reviews, but um, the reviews present mixed, but mostly positive uh, results in terms of uh, uh, physical activity outcomes. I say mixed as uh, literature shows uh, the results are not the same everywhere. For example, there are schemes in the US that um, the, the literature reports no significant changes on overall physical activity after the implementation of new cycling and walking routes. Uh, so it is uh, context specific. Next slide, please. Um, to better understand the effectiveness of UK-based interventions, um, we looked at three case studies in more detail. The first case uh, was Connect2 project, which is a major project led, uh, led by Sustrans with the aim of promoting uh, walking and cycling by improving local walking and cycling routes at 79 sites around the UK. Each Connect2 site uh, consisted of one flagship engineering project to overcome a physical barrier, for example, a bridge over a dual carriageway, combined with improvement to sign on road and off road feeder routes leading into those uh, flagship projects. Goodman et al. evaluated the effect of Connect2 initiatives in three UK municipalities of Cardiff, Kenilworth, and Southampton by surveying more than 1,700 adults at a baseline point and as a follow-up one year later and then two years later. The second case study that we looked at was the Fitter for Walking project, which was managed and delivered by uh, Living Streets. Uh, the project ran from 2008 to 2012 with the aim of improving um, walking routes in specific neighborhoods and promoting uh, walking in 12 deprived communities across five regions of England. 
The Future for Walking projects uh, focus on making changes to access, safety, and uh, aesthetics of local routes. Adams and Cavill uh, evaluated changes in the pedestrian use of the local routes at baseline point and at 12 months, and then 14 to 20 months after the project activities um, had commenced. The third case study was the Cambridgeshire Guided Busway uh, with parallel walking and cycling path. Uh, the guided busway uh, in Cambridgeshire is a bus network using um, 22 kilometers of segregated bus track, accompanied by a traffic-free path for pedestrian and cyclists. The aim of this project was to improve transport infrastructure to support active commuting, uh, to promote physical activity and improve uh, population health. Agilv uh, et al. Uh, assess this project by surveying uh, more than 1,100 adults in 2009 and also done a separate survey of more than 1,700 users in 2012. Next slide, please. Um, in, in the next couple of slides, I will uh, overview some of the findings of, of these three case studies. Uh, all the three case studies provided evidence of increase in overall physical activity levels in the local population after implementing the projects. Uh, for the Connect2 projects, patterns of use were very similar in all evaluated projects in the three uh, cities that I mentioned, with walking for creation being by far the most commonly reported use, cycling for recreation, and walking for transport were the other two common connect to uses. Uh, the least commonly used uh, reported in this study was cycling for transport. Uh, the researchers uh, who evaluated the connect to projects found strong evidence that the increase in the use of the introduced routes were, was larger among participant households without a car. Fitter for walking projects engage communities in identifying barriers and ask them for solutions. Uh, the research team reflected on these aspects of the projects and observed that engaging communities was helpful in increasing, in increasing the rate of walking for transport. Next slide, please. Um, the, finding of, uh, the findings of the Cambridgeshire Guided Busway project show that commuting practice, practices are complex and shaped by various changeable social and in, environmental factors. Uh, the research concluded that walking and cycling were of, uh, often incorporated into longer community commuting journeys made mainly by car or public transport, um, as Glenn mentioned. Um, Cambridge is very expensive to live in. It's my personal experience. And so people live outside and come to the city by car, parking around the city, and then um, um, continue their journey by uh, bicycle into the city. Um, the research team also noted uh, that uh, living closer to the intervention was associated with a greater likelihood of a larger increase in the proportion of commuting trips involving any active travel, a large decrease in proportion of trips made entirely by car, and an increase in weekly cycle commuting time. Uh, there was um, some evidence that the effect uh, was most pronounced among those who reported no active commuting at baseline, and observational evidence suggested a relationship between active commuting, greater, greater overall physical activity, and improved well being and uh, weight status. Uh, interviews carried out for, uh, for this uh, study uh, by the research team and people, um, and the, the interviews showed that people were unlikely to use the new infrastructure unless it is closely matched to, uh, to the journeys that they needed to make. Also, the interview showed that a range of other factors informing travel behavior, and these uh, generally involve considerations of comfort and ambience uh, or pleasantness, 
and also feeling safe. Next slide, please. Um, the overviewed case studies suggested that improved and newly introduced routes for walking and cycling may help to increase, uh, to increase overall physical activity levels. However, it may take time and may require additional marketing and outreach activities to increase the use and effectiveness of these routes. Living nearer uh, the intervention may increase the effectiveness of interventions in uh, increasing physical activity and uh, engaging communities in identifying uh, barriers and asking them to suggest solutions may increase the success of the intervention for increased active transportation. Next slide, please. Um, some conclusions uh, from the, the research that we've done, um, uh, the findings uh, suggest that the built environment has great potential, not only to improve health outcomes, but also to have wider social impacts, including building social connections and promoting social interaction, especially for the other case studies that we looked at like playgrounds. Um, hence, allocating substantial resources to invest in built environment in the places most in need should be a priority. Uh, organizations such as housing associations with long-term stewardship responsibilities are in a very uh, pivotal position to continually create, improve, and maintain the physical environment that uh, support communities to be healthy. However, providing the physical infrastructure may not, may not be sufficient on its own, and promoting the use of facilities through local programs and media communications can support communities to make the most out of um, investments uh, made in their local built environment. Thank you. And if you're interested uh, to look into our report, the link is there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie, and um, we're going to post a uh, link to the report. Um, I'm not sure whether it's going into the chat or into the Q&A, so keep your eyes on both. Um, thank you. So now I've got time for some questions um, from our speakers, and I do hope Richard's voice is up to this. If not, um, we're, we're happy for you not to join this. Um, Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's Thank fantastic. You. Um, I think on our agenda, it says that we'll move on to the next speaker at 12.15, but I'd like to move on at 12.10 to make sure there's time for our next speaker to have some questions as well. So we'll have it slightly shorter for this session. Um, so lots of interesting things there. Um, Katie, perhaps I could start with you. Do you get a sense of which sort of interventions are um, will encourage people to travel actively. Um, so you mentioned that um, you know it, it's not enough just to have the physical infrastructure, you need to do other things. Can you describe some of the other sorts of interventions that you came across in your research? Yes, um, in our research, when we looked at different case studies, um, um, because uh, these housing associations, they were thinking of investing on something. And they wanted to know whether a big major infrastructure change would be uh, a good value for money or some small scale interventions. And some of the uh, things that we came across were suggesting that you need both. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some, sometimes some uh, very small uh, interventions like um, having workshops or uh, even uh, having uh, walking groups, organizing walking groups, because this housing association, they also have a, um, a gym uh, branch. So uh, they were thinking of, OK, would it be uh, helpful to have uh, to organize walking groups or uh, to have sessions uh, around um, cycling, how to cycle? Uh, and uh, actually, the the evidence was showing that uh, actually it should be incorporated as uh, as uh, um, as part of the planning for these kind of projects. Great, thank you very much. And Richard, if I could turn to you now, you've undertaken wayfinding projects 
all around the world in lots of different places. Are there cultural differences to how people respond to them? Or is it very much about being a human being? You, you showed a slide showing a human brain. So is it something, do we all respond in roughly the same way? Or, or does it depend where you are in the world? Well, I, I think the fundamental, it's a very good question. I, I think the fundamentals are um, the same. Um, we've everywhere we've been, we we recognize that people always overestimate their ability and their knowledge of places. Um, people are always influenced by um, being given good information. Um, the the type of information is the the same. If you need to access information quickly, you might be looking at directional information. If you're looking to explore you might be looking at mapping information i think it's the the content itself and the way that you provide the content and the locations that varies uh mainly uh, that's the part that starts to fold in cultural um differences um and place differences but i think fundamentally we are all people are pretty much the same in our experience no matter where we are that's really interesting to hear um Fantastic. Now we've got quite a lot of questions. Some of them are, I think, sort of more relevant to our wider work around 20 minute neighbourhoods. So I'm just going to pick up some of these um, just to, because I'm not ignoring them. Uh, there's one about data sources for informing 20 minute neighbourhoods or livable neighbourhoods. And we actually had a webinar about uh, data um, not long ago. Um, so there, there's quite a lot about that. You know, do have a look for that webinar. It'll be on our website under our 20 minute neighbourhood resources. Um, but Richard, um, you you must have access to an enormous amount of data um, for councils, um, to, particularly in England. I don't know if you've got any advice about data they can get that might be useful. There's a lot of public health data out there. Um, where do you get your data from, if that's not a top secret uh, question? Um, it, it's certainly not. I mean, I actually i would say that we don't have a huge amount of data i think that there's a lot of information that that you can extrapolate but the amount of data that's causal that, that you could you could claim cause and effect on benefits for wayfinding um are, are not direct so you you can pull data about health benefits as we've done um that that talks about um that uh, talks about uh, uh, by uh, people walking more um you you gain health benefits i think these are all pretty well understood and in the literature in the medical literature and and uh, but but then the the relationship between that and wayfinding is is very difficult as i was explaining the the it's it's very difficult to control for all the other factors that that wrap around a wayfinding project we were doing a study just as um, uh, an evaluation of one of our projects just as COVID hit. Um, and, you know, we, we, what, what were we supposed to conclude that um, our wayfinding caused a, you know, 40, 50 percent drop in, in footfall um, because nobody was walking around anymore? It's that kind of thing. But uh, we, we generally keep our ear to the ground on um academic research to do with um cognitive behavior we have some good links with ucl um uh, on that score um we also kind of keep in with the the literature on nature science and, and those to 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 try and understand what what the um uh what the context is for us but uh, um the the actual research um that connects um wayfinding and information there's a few smarter travel studies that allow us to to extrapolate that, um, but there's there's not a great deal out there. Um, more more research needs to be done, in my view. Uh, I'm sure that'll be uh, something Katie wants to hear. Academics all always like to know that more research needs to be done. Uh, Katie, you, your research is particularly into work done by housing associations, and and obviously they do have a um, a really quite powerful role because they they look after entire places the homes and the spaces between them and the tenants um so they're in quite an unusual position um what, what about councils if you were to give them some advice based on your uh research if they want to encourage more active travel and sort of help with behavior change what sort of initiatives do you think they should be looking at i guess um some of the things, um, going back to your point about more research is needed, I think um, some of these public health um, public 
publications and academic systematic uh, publications, they, they have some good data, hard data, but what we don't know is the explanations behind them. So why people are not using these routes as much as, for example, the council expects, or uh, why things uh, in practice are not uh, working out the way that they want. So I guess more engagement with communities and understanding uh, why, uh, why they like or they don't like certain things or why they're not using uh, their bikes more often. Uh, would really give them some ideas of where to put their attention and uh, something which is, I think, uh, very well understood is more collaboration uh, between, uh, especially if you think about um, place-based interventions, it's all, always about putting the place in the center and then uh, thinking about how different organizations in, in that place, including public health organizations, housing associations, uh, councils can work together uh, to overcome a difficulty. In this case, might be uh, health inequalities. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Richard, turning to you, one of the um, very practical problems in terms of wayfinding is it's usually one of the last things that's installed and very often the budget gets cut by the end because everything else is overrun there isn't any money um, but what you're talking about is actually fundamental to place making how do you make sure that it isn't the thing at the end that gets cut and and out of interest which sort of budgets are paying for wayfinding projects that you work on which, which pot of money does it come from um, well, th this is the, one of the banes of my life um, as a wayfinding practitioner is that um, you're often, you're absolutely right, um, you're brought in towards the end once there are a number of fixes in the design and the design process, you become unpopular very quickly by recommending changes that nobody wants to hear or has the ability or the budget to make. Um, and uh, or you, you feel that you're providing a sticking plaster over dysfunction that ought not to be there if wayfinding was considered upstream in the design process. Um, now, urban designers and architects absolutely do a great job with wayfinding, um, but I do think it's um, something that I would like to see um, specialist skills brought into the process earlier. Um, because actually, if we came into a project and we didn't need to add so many signs or any signs, I would be very happy. Um, we, we only put them where they're needed, not where we um, we can make a quick you know pound. Um, so for me, I think it's um, definitely bringing it upstream is is a I advocate for that all the time. Um, budgets, um, well, uh, developers. Um, uh, are not great in uh, putting their hand in their pocket on wayfinding because it seems a soft discipline rather than um, an engineering or an architectural discipline. Uh, but urban designers faced this, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and now it's seen as much more integrated and wayfinding will be in 20 years time be seen as integral as part of this process. It's a journey that everybody's on. But we get budgets from um, effectively from a uh, um, city centre uh, managers, from marketing and tourism, um, from transport um, uh, infrastructure as an infrastructure project. So we, we get capex and opex budgets um, that flow in that way. But they're usually about um, repairing place dysfunction rather than how can we um, create an environment that does not require as much signage or information um, in the first place. And, uh, and as I say, that's where we'd love to be. Yeah, thank you for that. And I saw a wonderful tweet the other day, which uh, said that um, in the Netherlands, when they're creating walking and cycling infrastructure, if it's necessary to put a sign up, then the design has failed because it should be so obvious where you go or who can go where, or whether it's for bikes or cars or people that you shouldn't need to have a sign. Um, we're, so, we're all about that. That that yeah. would be ideal. It, it, of course, it can't happen everywhere. We know that no. there, there are going to be some places that are so complex for a variety of reasons. They need information, but an, an awful lot of that could be avoided with better design, better thinking about wayfinding and placemaking up front. Yeah, 
Exactly. Well, I hope that um, your talk today has inspired people to bring in wayfinding at, at the beginning and not right at the end as a sticking plaster, as you say. Uh, some of the questions we're getting in the chat, I think, would be actually better put to our next speaker. So um, I think I'm going to move on quite soon. Um, uh, so, Katie, any final thoughts for you um, about uh, the, the best ways to encourage people to use good infrastructure? If, if, it's, if the, the place is designed well, they've got, um, you've got your paths, you've got your bike lanes, it's all there. What, any final thoughts about how we can really encourage that behavior change? Um, I guess it comes with time and we have to be patient and uh, give people the, the time they need. Uh, but also, I guess, um, more information, more uh, encouragement in different ways. For example, uh, my workplace, uh, they have, well, we are in Cambridge and uh, it's a different city context, uh, but pretty much everyone is cycling and it's a, it's a culture now. Uh, and if you are you don't cycle, you you don't share that information with anyone. Uh, so um, it, we have to wait for. And I know England is not particularly doing um, that well in that sense, uh, but things are moving towards that. And um, um, I guess uh, with time and more information and more encouragement from employments and um the the cycle schemes are brilliant um have them more and um we will uh, we will have that transition sooner or later thank you and i think perhaps we are all being quite impatient when we think it took 50 years to turn our walkable cities into car dominated places um the the move in the opposite direction is happening quite quickly and when i cycle i often utterly surprised by the number of other bikes um, I see on the road. So things are changing. People are walking. Um, Centre of London now has wider pavements to accommodate more pedestrians, which is great. So uh, I think you're right. It takes time, but it is all heading in the right direction, if that's not a terrible pun. So thank you both very much for your contributions. And um, we will now move on to our final speaker of this session. Um, who is uh, Lawrence Fallon, and uh, I am just going to find my details. So welcome, Lawrence. Um, Lawrence works for Active Travel England, where he's the development management team leader. Um, I'm sure many of us are aware that the government is setting up Active Travel England as an executive agency to promote walking, cycling and wheeling. Um, it's in the process of being set up, so a lot of us don't know that much about it yet. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Lawrence to tell us a bit more. Um, Lawrence has over 20 years experience in transport development planning in both the public and private sectors. In his current role as development management team leader at Active Travel England, he spent much of 2022 undertaking liaison with planning and highway authorities across the country and with colleagues in DLUC, as Active Travel England prepares to become a statutory consultee for the planning process next year. So uh, welcome, Lawrence, and uh, I'd like to hand over to you, and, and hopefully we'll have time for a few questions for you at the end of your presentation. Great, thank you, Julia. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Really exciting stuff and excited to be here. Also to have the headline slot, it's a great honor. So you'll hear a few of the hits, but there'll be some new stuff as well. So uh, as we're a relatively fledgling organization, we um, like to embrace opportunities to collaborate with stakeholders. Um, and we recognize we can't change the world on our own, but we can certainly um, lay the groundwork and, and form those relationships, because really that's what the, the planning system is about. It's about having strong relationships, uh, the same objectives and a real uh, sort of critical thread all the way through. So if I could have the next slide, please. So uh, just running through what I'm going to be talking about today, a uh, brief overview of Active Travel England, um, what we've been sort of set up to do and what we've been doing this year as part of our pilot project. Um, if time allows, I've got a case study, but um, 
that we'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, but I'm going to start from the beginning, literally. So if we have the next slide, please. Great. So a bit about myself. Being born in a new town um, and having a master plan for a carpet, um, I clearly had no shame. Fr friends would be drawing dinosaurs and spaceships. I'd be working out how the town I lived in could be expanded to be much more interesting. So uh, as you can see, if you look closely, I've designed a maze of streets and an over-provision of sports facilities. Um, but that's the kind of thing you want when you're seven, eight or nine. So really, I was only ever destined to be a, a chartered town planner uh, with a bias towards transport. So we have the next slide, please. So if you look closely at the last slide, you'd see lots of cul-de-sacs, but you also see lots of car parks. Um, and you can see how our sort of local environment influences uh, child's view of the world. And it was no different for me. Um, this is where I grew up, uh, at the end of a long meandering cul-de-sac containing a maze of streets and the best part of about a thousand homes. Um, so a typical sort of sprawling 1960s extension to a market town, and similar to what we heard about from Glynn earlier. So I found this out to my cost when I was three, when I let myself out in the house for a walk. Um, I got horribly lost in this maze of streets. Um, perhaps a wayfinding system might have, might have come to my aid. Um, but whilst I was missing for about an hour, I'd only actually gone about half a mile. Uh, and I got a ride home in a police car as well. So it's all very exciting, um, although not for my family at the time. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So highlighted in yellow is the route you would have needed to have taken to get to the town centre um, from where I grew up. So being a long cul-de-sac, you would almost certainly face congestion and delay, uh, poor air quality, etc. cetera, um, because it's the design of the streets. If I could have the next slide, please. But in green is the route you would have took if you wanted to take um, a bike or to walk to the town centre. It's much shorter, much healthier, it was safe, um, and in a sense, it was a, an early sort of example of the fact that you can get about on, on foot and, and you can get to these locations. So it wasn't perfect. It's probably not how you would design something today, but a lot of the estate was crisscrossed by uh, networks of footpaths. Um, and as you can tell from the, from the layout, a complete absence of through traffic. So what was in the 1980s, uh, an estate full of kids on bikes, kicking balls around, jumping in the river, building dens, etc. I went to have a look a few years ago, um, and it's just completely changed. The, the, the streets seemed empty. Um, is it the demographics changed? People have grown up a generation, has it gone on a generation, uh, or has the population become more sedentary? So either way, um, designing and redesigning activity into our environments is so important. We've heard some really interesting case studies and research today, um, but the, for so long it's been about the commute and the peak hour and the morning and the evening peak, but not about the sort of local trips, the really important sort of leisure trips um, and um, supporting recreation and activity. Uh, next slide, please. So really this is getting to the heart of the fact that the behaviours we adopt when we're young continue into our adulthood and that's how we really need to be thinking about designing our environments. Um, a lot of the photos as you can see from myself and my friends were generally out and about on our bikes who didn't even leave the bikes in the garage or a shed they, they lived on the lawn um, and you just got on and off you went um, but yeah we, we seem to have lost that it seems to have been taken away so anyway enough about my life story um, fast forward to 2022 and the next slide and active travel England so this has um, come about as a sort of growing realisation in central government that we need to be more radical um, to change the status quo and, and to have the continuous high quality infrastructure and not the intermittent cycle routes or the, the, the dead ends, etc. So as we've heard earlier from Nicola, which uh, introduced uh, very well the, the gear change document and the uh, local transport mode 120 and the ambition for half of journeys in towns and cities to be cycled or walked by 2030. We, we do need to be ambitious about this because that, that's the level of change we, we need to see. So it's about enabling the creation of better streets, better networks, but also empowering and encouraging local authorities and communities to work together to achieve better. So we became an arm's length body this year from central government. So we've detached from our DFT moorings, although we're still very reliant 
upon that um, and really contributing towards the wider agenda and objectives. So transport decarbonisation, um, encouraging the least harmful forms of travel and promoting the benefits of public health um, of, of activity. So um, how are we going to do it? Next slide, please. So as you may be aware, uh, Chris Boardman was appointed as a National Active Travel Commissioner earlier this year. We've also uh, put in place our CEO, Danny Williams, as well as other key directors and uh, senior appointments. So when fully operational, we'll have just around under uh, 100 full-time staff across the organisation and broadly grouped into four functions. So uh, investments, so that's basically holding and allocating the active travel budget for scheme delivery. Uh, inspections, which is really as an assistance and enabler to, to allow councils to achieve best, best practice, uh, rather than just simply saying, no, that's not good enough, start again. Really, we want to take councils with us uh, and, and really uh, set out how they can achieve uh, better Data and intelligence, as we just heard, having the best tools and evidence in order to support decisions um, and, and financial decisions in particular, but also informing design uh, and also having that uh, backup for the planning and development side. Um, so as a statutory consultee to the planning process uh, in, in the next year, which I'll, I'll come on to now on the next slide. So uh, in readiness for that, we've been running a pilot study throughout 2022, um, re reviewing and reporting our findings diligently to our colleagues at DLUC. Uh, and really what we've set out to do is get out there and ask councils what it is that it feels is needed. Um, what, what's, what's the missing gap? What, what's the bit that we can do? So um, a, as part of that, we've asked councils to send us their major planning applications for us to review. Um, we've devised a toolkit uh, which we use to assess applications, which I'll come on to in a bit, um, but also used it as a pilot to uh, work out how we respond to planning applications and the, and the kind of uh, interventions that we make in, in the planning sphere. So we've made a point of tackling different types of development proposals. And, and like I say, at each tranche, we've sought feedback from um, planning and highway authorities because we really are occupying that space between the two. Next slide, please. So um, some findings from the pilot study, some of them won't be of any surprise. Um, firstly, the assessment of development, we're still seeing um, traffic generation uh, distribution, uh, the umpteenth appendices uh, attached to a, 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 a development's uh, transport assessment. And really, we need to be thinking about the outcomes development wants to achieve uh, and how to how to get towards those. and, and to look at how active travel um, will work in an environment rather than just distributing cars around a, a, a map. Um, policy as well, we're, we're seeing very variation really uh, in terms of integration at the policy level. Uh, so lo local cycling, walking infrastructure plans, as we heard earlier on, really need to be integrated with LTPs, local transport plans and the local plan. Uh, challenging sites, we deliberately ask for challenging sites because that's what we're going to be dealing with. Um, and as we've heard earlier, where it is more rural, where it is more market town, um, there are bigger challenges, but where the infrastructure isn't already in situ, but not to say that cities don't have um, issues as well, particularly in terms of space uh, and when we're looking at high density developments. Master planning, one of, one of my biggest bugbears throughout my career really is where those opportunities have been missed or where there has been a link through which has been struck off because it might be unsafe or unsavory. You know, we, we need to be thinking about the, the critical design of master plans. Um, and a, a lot of the feedback we've had is the timing. You know, when, when the active travel get involved uh, in a development and, and in most cases the, the sooner the better almost pre pre-app really to if we're to influence master plans. Um, the feedback's been largely positive um, cautious optimism but obviously um, we can't be everywhere all the time um, with with our um, resources uh, at the beginning so we, we do need to sort of pick and choose and triage what we get involved in where we can add best value. Uh, next slide please. So uh, this is the word cloud as some of the feedback that we've received. Um, and yeah, it, it, it comes across quite loudly that they require support, um, early engagement, um, and also just, just as a backup, another voice in the room. Next slide. So in terms of what good looks like, um, we've been formulating our ways of working and our objectives 
uh, and having that evidence base, uh, the toolkit, which I'll come on to in a minute, allowing us to scrutinize challenging poor master planning, um, but also providing that guidance, standing advice and support. So a, a lot of what we heard is, so, okay, um, we've got an issue with a, a small market town and, a, and an extension of 500 homes. Where is there a place that's done it right? You know, where, where have they really done it properly? And, and that's what we're aiming to build, uh, almost a compendium of best practice uh, for councils, but also for developers as well. We're, we're not simply there um, to, to assist councils, but we, we need to be across all parts of the planning system. Uh, and one of the things that I've certainly um, experienced in my career is, is that sort of gulf really between the, the, the urban designer, the, the architects, and also the, the engineers at the sort of delivery level and, and what gets missed or, or doesn't happen in between. Um, I think we can certainly um, provide some value to that space. So um, next slide, please. This is really a summary of what, what I've just said, you know, early involvement, how we assess planning applications and the, the all critical engagement and liaison. Uh, next slide. So that looks into that a bit further. I'm conscious that our uh, presentations will be shared um, after this session. So um, feel free to del delve deeper into that and uh, any questions that you have, please, please do ask. Uh, next slide. So this is a summary of uh, what our uh, consultee responses uh, are shaping up like. So uh, as I said, the assessment toolkit analyzes a range of criteria and it allows the user to select according to the type of application, the size of the application, whether it's outline, reserve matters, pre-app, et cetera. It auto completes. So if there's uh, some criteria, so for instance, either for the assessment, the layout, the number of internal junctions, um, the quality of the routes between the development and the local school or the local shops, this toolkit will allow you to pick it up um, and to score a development. So this isn't just for Active Travel England's use, this is, this is for practitioners throughout the industry. So um, transport development management, officers, highways, planners, developers, developers consultants, we really want this to be the sort of gold standard. Uh, and this is what we've been developing with the uh, essential help of local authorities over the last few months. So what does that mean? It doesn't tell you whether an application should be refused or approved. It gives you the evidence base on which to make recommendations. And that's what we intend to do uh, for developments that we're concerned consulted on above a given threshold to be confirmed um, very shortly. But really what we need to be doing is summarizing AT's position in a way that's uh, non-technical uh, and can be read by the likes of politicians, etc. So moving on to the next slide, we obviously need to have some red lines. Um, it's something we've sort of thought long and hard about, um, and, and a lot of this will be familiar. Uh, we're not intending to issue holding directions as you would uh, potentially see from national highways. We want to be much more collaborative in this space, uh, and we want to sort of bring people with us rather than being that stop, don't pass, go, um, hold up to the planning system. So all about accessible infrastructure, reducing car dependency, and better master plans and connectivity. Next slide. So one of the things we're able to do uh, and the benefit of being the central government is, is liaise across central government. So for instance, we are working with uh, the Office for Health and Sport England on rebadging the active design guidance. So it's a real sort of triumvirate of bodies pushing the agenda on health activity and, and successful master planning. Um, we're further strengthened uh, by Chris Whitty's appointment to ATE's advisory panel. Um, as I've said, we're working with DLUC and also within DFT um, to combine our um, expertise on guidance to create the best conditions really for, for active travel infrastructure uh, and also um, hearing from National Highways Historic England on, on you know, what it means to be a statutory consul CT, what systems and processes work for them. We've not forgotten the house builders in the private sector. We intend to do uh, a fair bit of engagement in the new year. Um, with those bodies, so so watch this space. Um, so the last couple of slides really are sort of a summary of uh, where we're going next to cover the next slide. So working on our triaging and prioritization process. Um, so that's basically using our best resources to respond to the right um, applications and, and proposals. The standing advice pack is something we will issue and we'll, we want to be universal throughout the planning system. That includes the toolkit, the user guide, the best practice, uh, guidance and our approach. 
Um, in terms of consultation threshold, we're, we're around sort of thinking 150 to 200 residential units or seven and a half thousand square meters uh, developments, but that, that's to be confirmed. Uh, and also working out our internal procedures uh, around case management um, and what technology we can use aside from tons of recruitment as well. So um, lastly, uh, in terms of the outward facing um, part of that, we'll be undertaking further engagement early next year, which you'll be hearing from us uh, very shortly on. Um, regional engagement team is a really important part of the organization. So providing that link between authorities, being that sort of eyes and ears on the ground, um, feeding back on not just engineering issues or, or bids, but also um, if there's a, a large site that's coming forward and it's in its early stages, we'd very much like to hear about it. Um, we also need to be clear about what our role will be post permission. So do we get involved in Section 38 or off-site works? Um, I think the answer is probably yes, but we need to think about how we do that. Um, and continuing the cross-government liaison. So um, looking at statutory consultee status in the spring, the date will be confirmed very shortly. And any other further questions, please ask. Um, the uh, next slide um, has uh, our email address. So just to sort of round off, it's obviously one of the most important things we can do through planning to improve people's lives. Um, I'm hopeful that's what gets all of us out of bed in the morning. Um, we're looking to getting out there and working um, with all of you, um, continuing our, our pilot project and, and really getting out there and being that sort of statutory consultee that, that has some clout. So I think I've used it all my time, but there, there is a case study, which I'm more than happy for it to be shared uh, later on. Um, but other than that, uh, I've probably used up all my time. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Um, unfortunately, I think you have used up time as uh, concerning the case study, but if we can share your slides, then people could have a look at that. And I really appreciate you joining us um, at a stage when you're still setting up and you haven't got all the answers. Um, it, it's really helpful for everybody to know that sort of what, what, what you're intending to do, even if you haven't sorted everything out yet. So thank you very much for that. Um, we have got some questions um, and a couple of minutes to put them to you. So one of them is about um, the, the problems caused by the mixture of adopted and non-adopted roads and footways that we now have. And the question is, will you address access on non-adopted road routes too? you know the answer to that yeah i mean i think that's that's a really tricky situation as, as the um uh, as the question poses and that's something that i've got a lot of experience in working on sort of section 38 agreements do we adopt it do we keep it private um is there a right of access is there a legal agreement that can allow um access through um such routes through the highways act that, that, that can be enacted but certainly i think what we've been looking at through the master planning and the urban extensions we've been looking at is 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 asking that question ourselves and saying well there's a either a public right of way here or a private permissive route which is is that key link to the the primary school uh, or or the local shops and we would very much urge and want to see um all efforts made to to, to make that a public route that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be adopted um but if it were, um, it's more likely to have the maintenance regime, um, the lighting, the width, the security that, that you would um, that you would expect. So I think certainly we would we would push um, for such routes to uh, to become adopted. But really, that's a matter for the, the local highway authority um, and then potentially the developer, depending on the ownership of the land. Great. Um, so we are coming to the end. One more quick question. What's the role of Active Travel England in NSIPs and, and the national infrastructure planning regime? Will you be a statutory consultee in that regime as well? I've had this question a lot. <laughs> so um, this is this is to be confirmed, but I think certainly there will be NSIPs, DCOs, etc. Um, that will prick up our ears and, and we would want to be involved in. And I think as I sort of referred to earlier our, our triage process uh, will aim to sort of sift what we what we do need to look at um, which could be for instance a railway station interchange we would certainly want to look at that um, as opposed to some new pylons which which we might not want to but I, I would expect us to, to get involved in those but that's that's to be confirmed. Okay well we have to stop there but thank you very much indeed and um, I hope we can invite you or a colleague back in about a year's time when when things are a bit more settled.
um, because you're going to have so much information which we'd, we'd love to share and help you share. Um, so I think we've got one final slide. Um, so thank you all very, very much for joining us this morning. And I know a lot of people will look at the recordings as well. I'd particularly like to thank Applied Information and Sport England for their support of this webinar. Um, without that, we really couldn't run it and we certainly couldn't hold it as a free event. So thank you very much. Thank you to all of our speakers who have been brilliant and provided some really interesting perspectives on how to create connected places. We will be running more webinars around um, uh, the practical aspects of how to create 20 minute neighborhoods. Uh, the next one will be on the 28th of February. So do keep an eye out for it. We will uh, be announcing it soon. It'll be on the TCPA website and it'll be on our uh, Twitter account as well. So once again, thank you all very much. Particular thanks to my TCPA colleagues who've helped run this and been fantastic behind the scenes. And we look forward to seeing you again on the 28th of February. Bye-bye.